today. And um, last, last week, or a little over a week ago or so, Franklin Graham uh, made a, a call for, for the churches in the country to, to lift up and pray for our president. And um, I, I heard about it just real quickly last week, and we weren't able to, to have that a part of our service. So I just want to take a moment and, and pray for the president. There are a lot of opinions about politics and all of that and about the president. But I'm going to read 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, and it says this. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in high, in, in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. Because Scripture calls us to pray for our leaders, I would like to follow through what, what Scripture says. Um, and uh, I know there's a lot of opinions there, but when, when, called, when God calls us to do something, it's time sometimes for us to put our opinions to the side and do what exactly Jesus has said to do. So let me pray here, and, and then we'll continue with our, our time. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to gather together, to, to know who you are on a, on a deeper level because of your word because of what you have laid out before us. And I do lift up our president. He needs you. He needs your love. He needs your grace. And he needs your wisdom, as do we all. Lord, I pray that you would bestow that upon him heavily, Lord. As your word says, you have a tremendous amount of wisdom. And Lord, I pray that he, the president, would lean upon you for guidance and direction as he leads. I pray for those who are leading alongside of him, Lord. I pray that you would give them wisdom as well, Lord, that as a country, as a whole, we would, um, we would support him in, in, in just a way that honors you, that we would show that we want to stand with you, Jesus, in being respectful of those that you've put in authority that you've put in positions over us, as you've put in positions of leadership. Yes, there's times that we disagree, but Lord, you have called us to pray for them, and so I do that this morning, Lord. I pray for our president. I pray that you would just direct his steps, direct his opinions, direct his words, direct his, direct his negotiations with others, Lord, that you would be the center of his decisions and opinions and presentations to people around this world, Lord, that you would be glorified through what happens there. Lord, I know that you have the power to be glorified through all people, but I pray specifically for wisdom for the president, that you would guide and direct him. In your name, Jesus, amen. amen. So, there's that. That's so important. And if, if, if bringing in a little bit of that to our time together isn't uh, dicey enough, I'd like to di delve into another dicey subject, and that is divorce. <laughs> we are in a series through the Sermon on the Mount, and, and we come today to Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 and 32. And I encourage you to open up the word to, to that passage there. Uh, we're going to be delving into the subject. Um, there's a lot to it, but I, I hope that what I communicate is, is from God here. And um, I want this just to be his heart, as I entitled the message, Jesus' Heart for Divorce. And I think that that's communicated through the word of God. Divorce is a touchy subject. Many have gone through it. Too many. Uh, there have been very little grace and understanding for those going through it. It's, divorce is rampant in, in this world, and there are as much disagreement in the churches as to what, if any, biblical allowance there is to it. Um, so today, we're just going to unpack what Jesus' heart is on this matter. Uh, read together with me. I'm going to actually just read uh, from, from the King James, actually, uh, on this verse, because I like the way that it puts it, but you can read in your translations as it's going to follow the same thought here. Uh, in, in chapter 5, verses 31 and 32, it says, It has been said, whoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, make, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. And I just want to unpack a couple words there as you look at that. Uh, one of the things it says, whoever shall put away his wife, the word here, the, the idea in Greek is apaleo, and, and that means to set free or to release, in which we get the same idea of apostate, somebody who's left something. And then it says, let her give her a writing of divorcement. And then in verse 32, it says, 
But I say to you that everyone who divorces, same word, apaleo, releases, set frees his wife, except on the grounds of sexual morality, which that idea there is pornea. So except, he releases his wife, except for pornea, makes her commit adultery. And whoever divor- uh, marries a divorced woman commits adultery. And, and this divorcement is to set free, to shun, to push her away. And so we're going to just delve into what this is talking about as a whole. The first point on your outline is the big picture. The big picture. And I think it's very important to understand the big picture in context to what's going on here. First off, uh, there's various passages in your, in your worship guide. Follow along with the passages there. The first that we'll look at is Mark 10, 1 through 12. And um, actually, I'm going to read 1 through 9. But in your, in your own time, you can pour over this as well. Uh, and then only verses 6, 7, and 8 are on the screen. But it says this, speaking of Jesus, um, it says, He left that place and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan. And crowds gathered around him. And as was his custom, he again taught them. Verse 2, Some Pharisees uh, came, and to test him they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed that a man write a certificate of of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment to you. Verse 6, this is on the screen. But from the beginning of creation, God made the male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. And therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. And, and we talked a lot about this a couple weeks ago as I was unpacking marriage and God's heart for marriage, really. Uh, God's desire for a man and a wife to separate from their individual families and to come together and to be married. And, and that is God's desire to see a marriage that unifies, that brings together two people in unity. And as it says there on the screen, to be joined to his wife and the two to become one flesh. And and. And that idea of, of coming together, two different people being one, and, and the New Testament talks about this, it's, it's a mystery. It's, it's something unique that happens there. And, and then it says, what God has joined together, let not man separate. So what's, God's, what's the big picture here is God wants to see two people come together to get married, to be one together in unity. And, and then that leads into, so if that's God's heart for marriage, that's the big picture here. Well, let's unpack this concept of divorce. So that leads us into, that's just a short point there, but it leads us into our second point, and we'll spend a little bit more time on this. Consider historical context. This is very important when you're unpacking something in Scripture. It's historical context and even the context of the passage that you're reading. Um, I'm going to read Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4, and that's what the, the Pharisees are often quoting here. And this is what Moses has to say about this in in the New Testament, really what God has to say about this through through Moses. So maybe you could flip back Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through 4. It says this, When a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes a certificate of divorce and puts it on her hand and sends her out of his house, and and she departs out of his house, and if she goes and becomes another man's wife and the latter man hates her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter man dies, who took her to be his wife, then the first husband who sent her away, he is, he is not to again take her as his wife after she has been defiled, for that is an abomination for the, before the Lord." And you shall not bring sin upon the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. So first, one of the reasons that we see it's always a man, especially in this passage, divorcing his wife, is not that the husband and the wife, the wife has, God doesn't think anything of her, but rather in that time, the women did not have authority to seek divorce. They were not viewed as ones who had authority to do that. So please take note that though this is the case in scriptural description, it's not God's heart or prescription in this concept of divorce. It's not just that God only wants the husband to divorce the wife and the wife has no say in that. But just because it's recorded in scripture doesn't mean that that's God's heart there. So in our reading today, Keep in mind that when the passage says that if a man should divorce his wife, that goes, that goes both ways. Um, 
So in order for us to understand more of the historical context, we need to dig beneath the surface to make more sense of why Jesus is bringing this up. What were the Pharisees or the leaders of that day teaching that wasn't in line with Jesus' heart? Because in this, in this passage here on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is delving into the whole, you have heard it said, but I say this. You have heard it said, but I say this. And so now Jesus is saying the same thing about divorce. You have heard it said this about divorce, but I say this. So what are they saying about divorce? What are the Pharisees talking about divorce that Jesus needs to really curb or correct their thoughts? So in Jesus' day, there are two schools of thought, two separate opinions about divorce. The one school of thought over here, we'll just say this over here, is the first school of thought is the conservative view and this is on the screen, um, of Shammai. And, and that's a conservative viewpoint of the Pharisees. And they, um, as they're interpreting this, they kept in mind what Deuteronomy actually said, and they defined the term indecent as allowing for divorce if sexual misconduct had occurred. And it could be proven by a witness. So that's the conservative side. So it's, yes, divorce can happen, but if there's sexual misconduct um, and somebody can actually prove that that happened. The liberal side is, the, is of Hillel, and it's, it's this. It says, defined uh, the term of divorce much more broadly and allowed it to cover any cause of complaint. Well, that's a problem. <laughs> According, accordingly, a man could divorce his wife for any reason. That's the liberal side of looking at things. So conservative says, well, if there's misconduct, God says, okay, yes, there can be divorce here. Uh, I'm going to allow that, not desire that, allow that. And then the liberal side says, well, the husband can decide if his wife does something that um, is, is not pleasant to him. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of things that happen in marriage. Your spouse does that's not pleasant to you. So indeed, one of the rabbis of the Hillel school went so far as to say that a man may divorce his, this is one, one rabbi's thought, a man may divorce his wife for no other reason than that he found another woman more beautiful. A man could see a more beautiful woman, and if he would rather be with her, he could do some paperwork, or as scripture says, write a, a paper of divorcement, and he could leave it, he could give it to his wife, and then he could go be with this other woman. And this would be acceptable. You know, she's not, sorry, liberal side. She's not as pleasant as I'd like, because there's, see this girl over here? So he writes a piece of paper, fills her out, here's, I'm divorced, we're done. And he goes over and spends, where's Jesus' heart on that? So I mean, I'm sure you can imagine how far out of hand this could take, they could take this. As long as I give her a piece of paper, it's okay that I divorce them. Husbands and wives saying that to each other. I, you know what? I don't like dinner. I guess we're done. Moving on to the next side. You know, that's not what Jesus' heart is. So what, what is Jesus' heart in, in, this, in this idea? Uh, and I think my microphone just disappeared. Oh, we're working on that. So with all this in mind, what is Jesus' view of, of divorce? Let's... Turn, flip over to Matthew chapter 19. Walk through this passage with me. Matthew chapter 19, verse 3. I don't think it's there listed in your, in your outline. Matthew chapter 19, verse 3. And through 9. And the, I, the con, what we have going on here is this same story. The Pharisees show up, and they ask Jesus this question. And they say to, the, they say to, the, to Jesus, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And then Jesus, in his usual way, he asks a question when they ask him a question. And he says, well, what did Moses command you? And this really, because Jesus is smart, Jesus is probing, I wonder, are they in the conservative field or are they in the liberal side? What is their thoughts on this? And look what, what, look what they say. It says, Jesus, uh, uh, and they answer Jesus, Moses permitted a man to write a bill of divorce and send her away. Well, actually, that's not what, Je what Moses said. Moses allowed it if something indecent had occurred or sexual immorality had occurred. So by making no reference to the ground of something indecent, the answer Jesus got reflected the liberal side of the Hillel view of, of divorce. So in other words, we think we are allowed to divorce someone for any reason. And Jesus then concludes that he brings all that together and he says this. 
He says, well, that's, that's not right. But anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery with her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. In other words, if you divorce someone with no godly grounds, God does not consider it acceptable. In other words, Jesus was following the Shammai, the conservative school of thought, which allowed divorce only if a man had, or woman had grounds for it. It wasn't just, you know what, we're fighting, I don't like this, this is unpleasant, I need to leave. And this is a really difficult thing to think about because, I mean, trust me, I... I haven't gone through a divorce, but I've talked to many people who have or who are on the verge of it. They're considering it seriously or they're sitting in my office and and they're talking about how difficult their marriage is right there and there's no other hope that they can see but leaving that relationship. And, And for me to look at them and say, stick to it. That's hard. That's really, that's really hard. We're going to delve into that a little bit more in a moment. But Jesus' heart here, again, that comes out is marriage is serious. Divorce is thus as well serious. Brings us to our next point. Jesus considers divorce serious. And maybe jot this down underneath this, underneath that point. Because he considers marriage sacred. Jesus considers divorce serious because he considers marriage sacred. That's a very important concept to bring into this. Malachi 2.16, this is on the screen, says, For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. We often hear that thrown out there. Oh, God hates divorce. And I said this a couple weeks ago. God hates sin. God hates sin. But to understand God's heart, his will, his desire on this, you have to understand God's will for marriage. Two people submitting to Christ and to each other, loving each other for the rest of their lives. There is no divorce in that plan. God's plan for marriage is a lifelong covenant, not a contract based on performance. If you do this, then I'll do this. Marriage is not a contract. Marriage is a covenant. Marriage is not a transaction. Somebody coming over and mowing your lawn. Like, you, make a, you sign a contract with them. If you mow my lawn, then I will pay you. If you do this, then I will do this. If you give me new tires, then I will give you money. If you don't, then I'm leaving. <laughs> That's just how that works. And then, and then we come to marriage, and, and Jesus' view of marriage is, is two people coming together to love one another, to glorify God together, to build one another up. And, and in that plan, it's not, well, when you stop doing what I don't want you, you know, then I'm going to leave and go find somebody else. Jesus is saying, no, I want two people to come together and humbly come before me with, with a heavenly view of marriage in mind and, and not to part ways because of of other smaller details. Now, take a moment and read verse, verse 32 of Matthew 5. We're all over the place. This verse has caused a lot of questions, and what that verse says is, but I say that everyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual morality makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adul- adultery. What, does, this mean, does this mean that one cannot marry again after they're divorced? Listen to this. By divorcing his wife on the grounds, or by divorcing your spouse on the grounds other than adultery, a husband makes an innocent spouse, or a wife makes an innocent spouse commit adultery if she remarries, as it assumes she would, historically speaking. Further, if Jesus makes ex- further, as Jesus makes explicit in Mark 10, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And Jesus is saying here that if divorce happens in an ungodly way, then don't step into marriage in light and hope that, you know what, this is all going to make everything better. I I divorce somebody over here, I'll find somebody else, and God will be happy with this. That's not God's heart with this. A man or a woman who has no right to divorce has no right to remarry. To do so initiates a chain of adultery because remarriages after illegitimate divorces result in very, very difficult relationships. When the detrimental effect on the children and other, other relatives in society are added, 
we see few practices that match divorce for destructiveness. It not only causes future sin, but also confusion, resentment, hatred, bitterness, despair, conflict, and hardships of every sort. If you've gone through that or you know someone who has, you've seen that divorce brings a heaviness like none other, a sadness and oftentimes a hate towards the other person that once you vowed to love. This is so, so sad. And I know that Jesus, his heart is broken over this as well. And I think what Jesus is trying to communicate to his listeners is that divorce is serious. And to dismiss someone with no biblical grounds, which is actually the biblical term here, is not viewed by God as acceptable. God does not view moving on from someone because you don't like something about them, which is the liberal side of how the Jews viewed it, and marrying someone else as God-honoring. But let me say this too. If, merit, if the marriage that you are in currently was entered wrongfully, then you shouldn't have entered it. But should you stay in it? And my answer to that is yes. Repent honestly before God and to each other. Admit that it shouldn't have happened. Ask for forgiveness from each other and before God and perhaps the former spouse. And then keep your promises that you have made to the other spouse, to the new spouse, rather than breaking your promise a second time. This is, this is hard. There's a lot of hard stuff with this. Relationships can be really, really difficult. God does not desire divorce as a quick way out, but he sees that as, as something that sometimes happens. Um, but if you're in the midst of a marriage right now or you know somebody in the midst of a marriage who's struggling a lot, seek help. Seek help. Don't sit back and say, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out for years and years and years. It's not that bad. We had a good day yesterday. It's okay. One good day doesn't match out a bad month. Like if you have a bad month going on in your marriage and you have one good day, you're like, all right, we can still make it. Go and find help. Go and seek out someone because God does not, again, God's heart for marriage isn't that you just push through it and have a terrible time in marriage. God's heart is that you see that two people come together and build one another up and he sees his kingdom built up through a marriage, that he sees a family coming through a marriage, that, that there's a legacy being built through that. And if you see that your marriage is not coming through with what God desires for marriage, don't sit back and say, I guess we'll just push through and see what happens. I, I just challenge you, I encourage you, do what you can to seek help. But that leads into the next point. Divorce demonstrates pride. Divorce demonstrates pride, and not necessarily to both people in the relationship. When I talk with clients, specifically couples, there's a phrase that I began to use in, in, in marital counseling freak, uh, probably the last six months or so, and I found it very potently helpful for many of them. Um, Pride kills. Pride kills. It's simple yet profound. As is the root of sin, pride comes about in various forms. Selfishness, frustration, stubbornness, a lack of forgiveness, an attempt to control someone else, not willing to accept what, that you have done wrong. It goes on and on and on. Pride is manifested in sin, thus pride kills. And I tell people that it's especially in relationships, when there is pride existing somewhere, you're not going to have a healthy relationship. That's true in the workplace as well, as I'm sure you've seen with, with coworkers as well. In, 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 uh, in Matthew 19, verse, three, uh, verse 8, as on the screen, Jesus' answer when the Pharisee, Pharisee said, they said, well, Moses said we can divorce, and Jesus said this. He's like, yes, Moses said you can divorce, but he said, here's the reason. Matthew 19, 8, and Mark chapter 10, verse 4 says this. He says, but he said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. Because of the hard, both, past, both Matthew and Mark say that. Because of the hardness of your heart, I allowed that to happen. And you know, I rarely count, I rarely interact with couples who are struggling in their marriage where there isn't a hard heart. Not that it doesn't happen, but rarely does that happen, especially if it's not a matter of communication. Because as you know, if you're married or if you deal with people, you know, communication is very important in marriage. And there are some couples that just don't know how to communicate at all. 
Like, that's a reality. And if you struggle with communication, it doesn't mean, oh, time to divorce and find somebody else. It just means maybe work at communication. But there's other times, there's other times that, that one person just says, you know what, I don't want to work at this with you. It's all your fault. It's not my fault. I don't want to change. It's all about you. Why can't it ever be about me? I'm leaving. I'm done with you. It sounds harsh. It's also real. Humility will hold a house together, but pride will tear it apart. Humility will hold a house together, but pride will tear it apart. All the devil needs is a little room to work, a little wedge, and he'll drive you miles apart. Yes, there are times, there are other reasons for divorce or a separation. And I, separation is not really context of what we're talking about here, but separation, I would encourage before I would say divorce. Sometimes the time apart is really helpful. So definitely consider that. But sometimes, yes, divorce happens for, uh, needs to happen for physical or emotional safety of the family. Sometimes it's because one spouse is entertaining another relationship, an adulterous relationship on the side of his or her marriage, which clearly is disregarding his vows to his spouse. And sometimes, as Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 7, the, uh, there's an unbelieving couple, say they get married and one person becomes a Christian, and the person who's not a Christian, who hasn't found Jesus, says, you know what, I'm not, I'm not doing this. I'm done. Paul says, yes, Yes, I will allow for that there as well. Um, so yes, there are times divorce is the only way to move forward in life. But keep in mind, it's not what God desires. It's not what God desires. And we as Christians often argue, what are the grounds for divorce? Right? Like, are these, was that a grounds for divorce? And honestly, like, and then it becomes justifiable. And honestly, that, that makes me kind of sad Sometimes I feel like what we're asking is, under what circumstances is God okay with divorce? And here's the answer, never. God never wants divorce, but he allows it. He allows it because he knows that we walk in the flesh and pride gets the better of us at times. God wants us to forgive. God wants us to forgive one another. God wants us to humble ourselves to one another. God also knows full well that both parties are not always walking in humility, but rather in pride. So divorce, regardless of the why, always breaks God's heart. And that moves us on to the last point here. Divorce misses God's intention. Divorce misses God's intention. Mark chapter, nine, uh, chapter 10, uh, verse 8, I think this is on the screen, Actually, I'll just read verses six through, six through nine. It says, From the beginning, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What God therefore has joined together, let no man separate. Matthew chapter 19, verse eight, the, first part of that, uh, the last part of that says, From the beginning, it was not so. Jesus, for his part, interpreted this passage as allowing for divorce only in cases of sexual morality, that is, sexual unfaithfulness. Even in such cases, divorce is only permissible and not encouraged or even preferable. Instead, Jesus strongly insisted that marriage, according to God's original design, was lifelong and permanent based on the statement in Genesis where man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. Jesus' conclusion was therefore that what God therefore has joined together, let no man separate. Paul likewise shares, he communicates the virtues, the values of marriage in Ephesians 5 when he talks about husbands, love your wives. Wives, love your husbands. Submit to your husbands. Walk in obedience to God in relationship with one another. That in marriage relationship, there would be an intimacy, there would be a connection in a marital relationship that is special and only in that relationship. That's God's heart for marriage. And, and I think one of the reasons that God, you know, he knows us well. He says in, 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 um, in sexual morality as, as a way out in divorce. I've, I've worked with some people uh, who, 
who their spouse has, has committed adultery, they've left, they've, they've spent a night or a month or whatever with somebody else and they've come back in the relationship, it is very, very difficult. And I just wanna say sensitivity here to those who have gone through that. It is very difficult to build trust with somebody. Your most intimate, the relationship that you had, that you've promised lifelong relationship to if they've left you to be with somebody else. In specifically sexually, in the most intimate part of your own marriage. It is very difficult to build trust in other parts of your relationship there. Very, very difficult. And I think that's why God, Jesus says, yes, yes, I see that there. Sometimes that, that I'm going to allow that to happen if there's no reconciliation that's able to happen around that situation. Because building trust, again, if there's no trust in a relationship, in a marital relationship, that's not a very good marriage. So all this is very interesting. It's fascinating if, you're not, if you haven't walked through that. But where does that leave us? Where does that leave us who maybe haven't gone through this? And I think it's this. It's Jesus has a very high view of marriage. He recognizes that though things go wrong and divorce is, yes, a way out of a union which God deems sac- sacred, God, yes, he hates divorce, but he allows it because of the hardness of our hearts. Marriage needs to be worked at. But when things go wrong, divorce is not the second, and listen to this, divorce is not the second unforgivable sin that many churches make it out to be. It also isn't something to jump into lightly, as I'm sure you've drawn from today's study. If separation is the first, is first, is the first possible step in reconciliation, I would encourage first separation rather than let's just divorce. But even then, cover that in a lot of prayer and a lot of counsel Cover that in a lot of wisdom. See what those options are. I believe that recognizing Jesus' view on divorce will help us to respond with compassion to people who have gone through such a traumatic experience such as divorce. Because I promise you, those people who have gone through divorce, they didn't want it almost always. And almost never was it pleasant for anyone, regardless of the faith that they have. So if that is you or someone you know who has gone through divorce. May I offer a little bit of advice? Be gracious. Be gracious to others who have gone through such an experience. Yes, God does not want it to happen because God has a sacred view of marriage, but they didn't either many times. Oftentimes, it's the only way out I see is this, and so I'm going to walk into that. I realize as well that this is a packed subject. There's a lot of other directions we can go with this. And so if you would like to talk with me more about it, let me know. Shoot me a text. Send me a Facebook message. Shoot me an email. Come and snag me somewhere. Come by my office. Say, hey, can we talk more about what you talked about on Sunday? Um, There's a lot of other things that are really a part of this this message of of God's view or Jesus' view of divorce. You can move to the next slide. But even in such a heated and controversial topic, Jesus has grace and love. Jesus has grace and love. And that's something that we all need, regardless of our marital status. We all need grace and love. And and as we look at that, regardless of where you are, whether it be with relationships or other things in your life, grace and love are found at the cross. That's where grace and love are found. Jesus hung on the cross for the people that he gave his whole life to and they deserted him. That's the very grounds that Jesus said divorce is permissible. Divorce, I mean, yes, I, I promise union to you and then one party decides to leave and Jesus says, okay, I, I, I say that that's okay. You can, you can part ways and go somewhere else. Jesus though, he says, I loved you so much. I want union with you. And that's why the picture of, of our relationship with our spouse and our, as the church's relationship with Jesus is the same thing in marriage. And Jesus says, you know, even though I promised union to you and I saw you leave and go the other direction, you remember the Garden of Eden? Uh, the Garden of Eden, Garden of Gethsemane? And, and all the disciples, they leave. They desert Jesus. And Jesus, he doesn't say, you know what? Never mind, I'm done. He says, no, no, no. Even though all of you have left me, I will still go to the cross. Think of the songs that that declare that same truth, that even though our hearts 
tarry away from Jesus. He says, I still have grace and love for you, and I will still accept you back. So wherever you are in your relationship with Jesus, if, you have, if you're in the place now that you're like, you know, I've kind of left, I've kind of wandered away, Jesus says, I'm not going to take that, I'm not going to take that out and say, you know what, I'm done with you too. He says, I'll be here, waiting with open arms, ready to receive you with grace and love, as we are called to treat others who have gone through all sorts of painful experiences. Let's show Jesus to other people. Let's demonstrate what Jesus did on the cross to our brothers and sisters. Let's demonstrate that kind of love and grace. Even in areas like this that we talk about today, even in other areas that often we want to just say, oh, that, that's not right, you know, I'm just going to pass some judgment there. Let's say, you know what, what's Jesus' heart about that? Does Jesus have love and grace for them? Because I want to have love and grace for them if he does. So, so powerful. So regardless of where you are, come to the cross today. Let Jesus be your vision. Let Jesus be where you look. Not, not over here and not over there. If you found yourself drifting away, go back to the cross. Let him be your focus because it's there that you'll find restoration. It's there that you'll find forgiveness. Regardless of what's happened in your past, you can't change what's happened in the past. It's past, it's gone with, it's done. And that's, Jesus was very aware of that. And then he went to the cross and he says, whatever your past sins are, I have wiped away your sins as far as the east is from the west. I've wiped away your sins. All the stuff back here and everything out here is gonna be wiped away, washed clean at the cross. No matter what that is, all you gotta do is fix your eyes on me. Commit your life to me and you will find restoration. Lord, I thank you for the cross. I thank you that we are able to find restoration and healing in you. I thank you for your love and for those here today who have gone through an experience like leaving their spouse for one reason or another. Lord, I pray that you would draw them close to you, that you would help them feel and know your love and grace, that you would lead them towards you, that you would help others in their life to be gracious to them as well. As we, as we sing this closing song, Lord, I pray that you would help us to worship you with our hearts, that you would be our vision in everything that, you, that we do, that we would come back to you and seek your heart on these matters, that we would seek your spirit and where your spirit is taking us as opposed to our judgmental minds at times, our opinions. But marriage is sacred, Lord, and you hold it as such. Help us to do the same. In your name, Jesus, amen. Uh, we're going to close our service with a, with a song, a great song. If you would like to pray...